Olá, boa tarde a todos. É com grande prazer que hoje a gente começa a, a qualificação, o exame de qualificação da Karine. É, Karine é, Rodrigues Pereira, nós vamos começar o exame de qualificação. Eu vou pedir licença porque a banca tem o professor Jeff é, Foster, que é da Universidade de, do Norte, do Northern Arizona University. Nós vamos fazer toda a nossa conversa em inglês. Eu vou começar agradecendo a todos os participantes do laboratório que estão assistindo e aos familiares da Karine. Então, é, vou começar agradecendo a participação da banca. Thank you. Duda, você pode colocar todo mundo? É, I would like to thank you, Dr. Jeffrey Foster, from Northern Arizona University, for having accepted the invitation to be part of the committee of Karine. Uh, I would like also to thank Marcos Canales for having also accepted and Dr. Andre Pereira Laje. And also I want to thank you, Dr. Vasco, for being uh, part of the com uh, committee co-advisor of Karine. So we start the, this exam with uh, Karine's presentation. Karine has um, around 40 to 50 minutes to present the results of uh, her project. And then we start the asking her questions yeah, about the, what he presented to us. And um, I think is that, are you ready, Karine? Yes. So thank you all very much for having accepted and for being here with us uh, in this afternoon for uh, Karine's qualification exam. If anyone want to say something or if not, we can start the presentation. Duda, can I share my screen? Can you see? It's okay. Are you seeing the the slide? The first. Yes. Yes. We are slide? seeing your presentation, Karin. Thank you. So you are going to be here. Okay. First, I would like to thank the members for accepting the invitation to participate in my qualification committee. And the title of my presentation is Genomic Epidemiology of Brucella Abortus Isolated from Cattle in Brazil. I will start with a general introduction, and then I will present my work in the format of three chapters, with preliminary results ending with the final considerations. Brucellosis is a disease of enormous importance worldwide, which has a major impact on public health and huge losses in livestock. In Brazil, brucellosis is endemic, caused by Brucella abortus. Aiming to mitigate the economic losses in livestock and reduce the transmission of brucellosis to humans, in 2001, the National Program of Control and Eradication of Brucellosis and Animal Tuberculosis was created. It is based, it's based mainly on the vaccination of wafers, diagnosis of animal in transit, and the slaughter of positive animals. Advances in new generation technology have generated innovative solutions for epidemiological investigation and surveillance of pathogens. The whole genome sequence of Brucella abortus strains can increase the knowledge about the pathogen and generate improvements in the control and prevention measures used by PNCIBT in Brazil. In fact, the integration between the analysis of epidemiological information and complete bacterial genome data has made it possible to conduct an approach known as genomic epidemiology. The first chapter is entitled First Report of Isolation and Whole Genome Sequence of Pseudocrobacterium Saccharolitical Strain in Latin America. The Brucellaceae family is composed of several genera, being Brucella, Ocrobacterium, and Pseudocrobacterium the most important. Pseudocrobacterium will be covered in more details in this chapter. The genus was described in 2006 and comprises four species, isolated both from the environment and from humans. Brucella, Ocrobactrum, and Pseudocrobactrum are genetically very close and sometimes difficult to distinguish these three genera due to the large amount of genus shared between them. The low diversity between the genera, the similar clinical presentations of the infections, caused by these pathogens, and the occurrence of cross-reactions in some tests can culminate, can culminate in misdiagnosis. This highlights the demand for methods capable of correctly differentiating these bacteria. And one approach that can be implemented is the combination of whole genome sequencing and the, constru the construction of phylogenetic trees, 
in order to perform the correct diagnosis of these microorganisms. The aims of this study were to report the first isolation and identification of Pseudocrobactrum saccharolitico in Latin America, to describe its phenotypical and genotypical characteristics, and to identify the correct phylogenetic classification of the strain 115, previously identified as Brucella. The strain 115 was isolated from a lymph node of a bovine in 2008 in Ituiutaba, Minas Gerais. Several phenotypic tests were performed in order to characterize the isolate. As strain 115 was initially identified as brucella, some antimicrobials commonly used in the treatment of human brucellosis were used to determine the minimal inhibitory concentration in agar, following the CLSI protocols. The antibiotics tested were ciprofloxacin, doxycycline, streptomycin, gentamicin, ofloxacin, rifampicin, and trimetropine plus sulfametoxazole. The strain DNA was extracted using a wizard kit, and the two molecular biology tests were performed, the Brucella genus-specific PCR and Amos PCR. The whole genome sequence of the strain, 115, and uh, was performed on the Illumina HiSeq platform. The quality of the reads were evaluated in FastQC program and the genome wa were, was assembled in Nubel software. Two pseudocrobactrum saccharolytic strains were used as reference based on their average nucleotide identi identified values. The scaffolds were ordered in Medusa and the gaps were closed in genome finisher software. Finally, the draft was annotated in PROCA. The 16S and HIC-A genes were used to build two phylogenetic trees. The analyses were performed according to Kumar using MEGA program with 24 strains downloaded from NCBI. And to build the tree, we used the neighbor joint re reconstruction method uh, with Kimura two parameter correction. The strain was identified as a grand negative and showed a positive reaction in all the texts, except for the requirement for supplementary carbon dioxide and citrate test. Minimal inhibitory concentration values for each antimicrobial test were presented below. As there is still no defined breakpoints for the genus, for the genus Pseudocrobactum, it was not possible to classify the strain as susceptible or resistant, despite the high concentrations of streptomycin, rifampicin, and trimetropine plus sulfametoxazole that was necessary to inhibit the growth of the bacteria. The strain 115 amplified in the Brucella genus-specific PCR, but had a negative result in the Amos PCR. This bacteria exhibited high values of in the analysis of average nucleotide identity, when it, this draft was compared with two other strains of Pseudocrobactin saccharolitum. The genome was deposited in a draft form at the NECBI with 16 scaffolds, four gaps, and around 3.8 million base pairs. It also exhibits a height coverage and a percentage of mapped reads. The phylogenetic tree of the 16S gene demonstrated that the cluster of the strain 115 with the Pseudocrobactrum saccharolyticum CCUG, although a low bootstrap value was observed. In the HEC E3, grouping of the strain 115 with the Pseudocrobactrum saccharolyticum CCUG type strain was observed with a bootstrap equal to 100%, enabling the classification of this bacteria at the species level. The strain 115, previously classified as Brucella, is actually a pseudocrobactin saccharolytic strain. The incorrect diagnosis of the strain has led to a false positive result for Brucella, which can have a great impact, especially if we consider these in regions in a more advanced states for brucellosis control, as Santa Catarina in Brazil, or where the disease has already been eradicated, as some European countries. The animal brucellosis misdiagnosis in these regions can generate some impacts, like the high costs in conducting epidemiological traceback studies, unnecessary slaughter of animals, 
loss of the Brussels laws is free status and even barriers that can become that can occur in the national and international trade of animals and their products. The sequencing of the 16S and HE genes increases the specificity of the diagnosis and could be recommended to be implemented in the following situations. In regions er er eradicated for brucellosis or advanced in control, since the identification of positive animals is rare and when it occurs, it has a high impact, or in endemic regions for brucellosis, but only when a disagreement in the diagnosis is observed with a typical result obtained, since the sequence of these genes in all the positive cases would be unavailable since it is expensive at a large scale. The sequences of these genes are very useful in improving the diagnosis. However, the whole genome sequence could expand some the knowledge about this bacteria since it makes it possible to conduct studies related to host parasite relationship, virulence factors, antimicrobial resistance mechanisms, and metabolic functions. The whole genome sequence also enabled the identification of the isolate 115 as Pseudocrobacter saccharolyticum, first reported in Latin America. Genius from Brucellaceae family have different behaviors against antimicrobials. While Brucella is normally susceptible to several drugs, Ocrobacter is naturally resistant to the most of antimicrobial classes. Although Pseudocrobacter does not have a breakpoint for antibiotics, the strain 115 showed high values for streptomycin, rifampicin, and trimetropine plus sulfamethoxazole, being tempting to speculate that there seems to be a tendency to multidrug resistance in the strain. So that the defi definition of breakpoints for this genus is very important since this pathogen had already been isolated from humans and from animals, thus having a zoonotic potential. In conclusion, the study reported the isolation and the whole genome sequence of the first strain of Pseudocrobactrum saccharolyticum identified in Latin America. Furthermore, it was demonstrated that the sequence of 16S and HIC8 genes is a highly specific diagnosis method capable of differentiating Brucella and Pseudocrobactin strains, especially important in regions where brucellosis had already been eradicated. The second chapter of my qualification is entitled Pan-Genome Analysis of Brucella Bottles Strains Isolated from Cattle in Brazil. The increased number of Brucella abortus genomes available in online platforms have provided a lot of advances in brucellosis research. When several genomes of the same species are sequenced, it's possible to perform comparative studies as pan-genome analysis. The identification of core genome, the genes present in all the isolates, chair genome, the genes presenting only on one or more isolates, and the singletons, the genes unique to each strain, through the pan-genome analysis can be applied in the development of new, new vaccines, in the identification of antimicrobial resistance mechanisms, and provide advances in the treatment, control, and prevention of brucellosis. The aims of this chapter were to perform and to compare three pan-genome analyses of brucella abortus strains isolated from care in Brazil, alone or in combination with complete genomes available in NCBI. Besides, we aim to report the addition of 53 complete closed Brucella abortus genomes isolated from CARO in Brazil to the NCBI platform. The study analyzed Brucella abortus strains previously isolated from CARO in Pará, Tocantins, Minas Gerais, São Paulo, Santa Catarina, and Rio Grande do Sul between 1997 and 2008. The strains were previously characterized for susceptibility to antibiotics, commonly prescriptive for the treatment of human brucellosis. Their DNA were extracted using a wizard kit, and their whole genome sequences were performed in Illumina HiSeq platform. The quality of the reads were also evaluated in FastQC program, and the genomes were assembled using Edena and SPATE software. 
Tribrocella botus strains were used as reference, based on the average nucleotide identity values, and in their assembled method reported in articles. The scaffolds were ordered in contiguator, and the gaps were closed in the genome finisher and gap blaster softwares. The persistent gaps were closed manually by editing the sequence in the CLC software. Finally, the genomes were annotated in PROC. The pan-genome analyses were divided in three subsets. The first subset was Panini CBI, using 21 complete genomes of Brussels abortus downloaded from NCBI platform until November 2020. The second subset was Pan Brazil, and we used 53 complete genomes assembled in this study. And the third and last subset was Pan Total, including both sequences from NCBI and from this study, totaling uh, 74 complete genomes of Brussels abortus. The pan genome analysis were performed using OrthoFinder to identify the ortholog genes and to classify them in core genome, shared genome, or singletons. An in house script was used to calculate the HIPS law and classificate the pan genomes as open if alpha is less than one or close if alpha is higher than one. The in house script also calculated the theta values to predict the stabilization of the core genome and the singletons. In Panini CBI, it was observed a pan genome with 3,200 genes. The values of core genome are presented together with the prediction of alpha and theta values for core genomes and singletons. In the flower diagram, we can see the core genome represented in the center and the singletons from each strain in the petals. In Pan Brazil, we observed the pan genome with 3,400 3, genes. And in Pantotal, it was observed a pond genome with 3,800 genes. The deposit of the 53 Brussels abortus genomes in NCBI generated an increase of 250% of in the number of complete and closed genomes available in the platform. The Brazilian strains have a vast genetic, genetic repertoire with five 143 genes reader though not seen in Brussels abortus from other regions in the world. So this increase, in, so this increase in the knowledge about the genetic composition of Brussels abortus may contribute to, studi to studies involving metabolic pathways, evolutionary story, and molecular fingerprint targets for epidemiological studies. The addition of new strains to a pan genome, besides increasing the knowledge about the genetic composition of Brussels abortus, reduces the percentage that the core genome represents inside the pan genome, as well as its value predicted for theta. This decrease is very important because it directs the choice of the possible vaccine targets that are, effect that are effective for the entire species, which can be identified by performing reverse vaccinology analysis. The addition of new isolates to the pan genome also leads to an expected increase to the alpha value, making the pan genome more prone to the closed status. However, the opposite was observed. After adding 53 genomes, the alpha value decreased. A uh, possible explanation for this may be due to the highest diversity incorporated in the pan total, with the addition of more than 500 genes in, by the insertion of the Brazilian genomes in the analysis. In fact, uh, the Brucella abortus Brazilian strains exhibited a high diversity when compared to NCBI genomes, but a low diversity among themselves, confirmed by the highest alpha value observed in Pan Brazil. This inference can be supported by the epidemiological context of the genomes included in each subset. While in Brazil, we have the genomes isolated from a single country, in interval of 31 years, the genomes available from NCBI were isolated for at least three continents over an interval of 96 years. For organisms that have many sequenced genomes, a representative sampling from a geographical approach can be performed in order to obtain better estimates for plant genome predictions, but it's not the case of Brucella botus. You don't have this large amount of sequenced genomes. <laughs> The theta values for singleton's prediction decreased when new genomes were added in the analysis. 
This was predictable since when new strains are sequenced, the genetic composition of the study organisms is more elucidated, reducing the possibility of finding new exclusive genes. The theta values for singletons from Pan Brazil was the smallest due to the low diversity that they isolate exhibits among themselves, as previously discussed, culminating in a lower occurrence of unique genes in a single strain. The identification of singletons can be very useful in the analysis of genetic markers for antimicrobial resistance, considering that a single gene could be responsible for the expression of this phenotype. Moreover, when it comes to Brucella, which is highly conserved, the analysis of these unique genes are even more relevant. The studies of functional group of genes, phylogenomic, identification of genomic island, and implementation of machine learning methods can be conducted from this data generated by the pan genome analysis. These analyses have a great potential to increase the current knowledge about Brussels abortus, especially when, integrate, when integrated with the phenotypical and epidemiological data av already available on these isolates. In conclusion, Brutella abortus was classified as an organism with no open pan genome. The inclusion of the Brazilian genomes was responsible for adding more than 500 genes to the genetic composition of Brucella abortus, and the pan genome, core genome, and singleton subsets will be used to perform qualitative analysis, enabling a better understanding of the genetic mechanisms associated with phenotypic and epidemiological characteristics of the isolates. The third chapter of my qualification is entitled Whole Genome Sequence of Brucella abortus strains reveals variants post potentially associated with antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial resistance is one of the most concerning threats to global health and food security by worldwide public health organizations. In the last decade, Brucella strains have been classified as resistant and multidrug resistant to antimicrobials commonly used in the treatment of human brucellosis. This is an alarming scenario, considering that brucellosis is a zoonosis responsible for half a million new human cases annually, and in addition to the great losses that it can cause to livestock. Since the occurrence of antimicrobial resistance was recently observed, its genetic basis are not yet fully elucidated so far, which prevents the understanding of its impact on human and animal infections. The advances in the next generation of sequencing technologies have enabled the analysis of a large volume of genome data to obtain a broad view and a better understanding of the genetic determinants related to antimicrobial resistance. However, for Brucella genus, and specifically for Brucella abortus, the search for molecular determinants associated with antimicrobial resistance exhibits two main limitations. The first one is the low availability of genomes with information on, on antimicrobial susceptibility phenotype, phenotype reported in NCBI. We only have four strains that we have data on antimicrobial susceptibility. And the second difficult is related to the tools available for mapping genes potentially associated with resistance that are mostly not des designed for Brucella. Uh, it's likely that the genetic markers of resistance in Brucella species are related to the occurrence of point mutations. The main platforms that investigate the genetic basis of antimicrobial resistance do not present this level of refinement in which a single nucleotide substitution could be possibly responsible for a resistance phenot phenotype. So we don't have these detailed information for the most of the platforms that we have available until now. And we need to open the view and to, to focus and increase the resolution of our findings. This study aimed to establish a preliminary strategy and determine the genetic markers for, of antimicrobial resistance of 53 Brucella abortus strains, naturally resistant to antimicrobials isolated from cattle in Brazil. The strains, sequencing, and assembly methods are the same as in the, check, the second chapter, so I will going to skip this part. In this part, in this, it was the same. 
The identification of genetic variants were performed in PERSNIP using 53 Brazilian strains and three strains downloaded from NCBI. An in-house script was used to integrate the lock tag from PROCA, the variants from PERSNIP, and the antimicrobial genes from CARD, enabling the identification of which were the non-synonymous genetic mutations possibly associated with antimicrobial resistance in Brucella abortus, as well as their functional products and biologic process accessed in PFAN, QuickGo, and Unipro. The SNPs were filtered in coding sequences and non-synonymous mutations. Four of them were identified in the, in the CARD database and will be better investigated. The genes identified were PAB, RSMA, MDTB, and MSBA, with the following informations. The variant in the RSMA gene was identified in a strain resistance to an aminoglycoside. This gene is involved in the synthesis of a protein that enables the 16S RNA dimethyltransferase activity. The methylation of this product can confer a high level of resistance to aminoglycosides, including gentamicin. Moreover, a synchronization between the occurrence of resistance-mediating RNA methyltransferases and RSM, post-transcriptional regulatory system, were, was already identified, suggesting a possible connection with gentamicin resistance phenotype observed. The variants in MDTB and MSBA genes were observed in the same strains with reduced susceptibility or resistance to rifampicin and gentamicin. The metabolic pathways of MDTB and MSBA genes products are involved in the RND family and in the ABC family related to influx pumps. The resistance to antibiotics due to the overexpression of these efflux, efflux pumps is frequently caused by mutations in the genes from this family, the regulatory genes, or the transcriptional factors like MDTB and MSBA. Therefore, this mutation could be associated with the resistance to rifampicin and gentamicin. The last mutation was in the FAB gene. The FAB gene codifies this product that, that is located in the cell membrane. Although this gene is related to the expression of multidrug transporters and alteration of antimicrobial target sites, which can cause anti antibiotic cross-resistance, it can be inferred that the reduced susceptibility to rifampicin observed in the Brazilian strain that present this mutation are probably not related with this gene, since the S19 vaccine strain was susceptible to rifampicin and also exhibit the same variants. The integration between the CARD platform and the results of the analysis carried out in PROCA and PARSNIP were not able to provide a complete and embracing view of all the genetic mechanisms potentially involved in each one of these observed pheno phenotypes, since only the non-synonymous mutations were analyzed in this approach. This limitation could be overcome with the implementation of statistical methods capable of identifying the main, polymer farms, the main polymorphisms related to the observed resistance phenotypes, using, for example, the principal component analysis approach. In addition, the use of platforms that enable the understanding of regulatory networks, such as Corine Hegnet, which has been adapted for Brucella, can be very useful to identify these variants and identify these variants that may have an indirect influence on the occurrence of antimicrobial resistance, like in the reg regulatory genes. In conclusion, the whole genome sequencing of the 53 Brucella abortus strains enabled to identify alleles in RSMA, MDTB, and MSBA genes, possibly related to resistance to gentamicin and rifampicin. Novel strategies, including PCR and, and the identification of transcriptional regulation mechanisms involving the antibiotic resistance, will be performed as an attempt to better understand the genetic basis involved in these events in Brussels abortus. In the final consideration, 
This association of epidemiological and genomic data from Pseudocrobactrum saccharolitico and Brucella botus strains isolated from Brazil provided important insights into these pathogens, such as the correct diagnosis of gene of Pseudocrobactrum, the expansion of the genetic repertory of Brucella botus, and the identification of some genetic polymorphisms possibly associated with antimicrobial resistance. In addition, the performance of bioinformatic analysis based on the whole genome sequence of these bacteria generated data that will be further investigated using various approaches in order to expand the current knowledge about Brucella botus and to apply it strategically in the control and prevention of the zoonosis. I would like to thank APIS, FAPEMIG, and CNPq for the financial support, to UFLA, Professor Elaine, UFMG, Professor Vasco, Professor Andre, and to all of my friends and collaborators from LAM and RECOM for all the support in this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karin, for your presentation. Um, first, uh, before we start your the argue, Karin, I would like to say uh, some few things about how the qualification exam works in NUFLA. Uh, Duarda, can you please put the committee here, please, in the screen? Um, uh, we have decided, Karin and I, that um, we it would be better for her having her qualification exam now because she could do that next year but uh, she's planning to go in May to Dr. Jeff's lab to uh, do part of uh, PAG there so we thought uh, Dr. Andre and Vasco who are Karin's co-advisor that would be very nice that she we can we could present the results that are very preliminary we know that to the committee and uh, we can decide which uh, which uh, way, now which uh, analysis we should do from this data because, because we we close the genomes and we have the genomes ready to work on them now in December. And uh, we have, we know that the data are not close and uh, we have much, a lot of work to do with this, uh, all this information, but we think that, that now it's a great opportunity to have the opinion from the uh, several specialists, Brucellos and the genomic specialists as Dr. Jeff, Dr. Andre, Dr. Vasco, Dr. Marcus. So um, the exam, qualification exam in UFLA, uh, in the beginning, Karini do the, her presentation and then we start uh, arguing her. Uh, usually we start from the most um, foreign member so in this case, we are going to start with Dr. Jeff. Uh, he can uh, argue Karin uh, on the presentation, on the document, and uh, the question that he sent to her before uh, the document. So once again, thank you very much, Jeff, for, for having accepting the invitation to be in the committee today, and also for uh, accepting Karin to stay in your lab for a few months. Thank you very much. Great, and so you want me to ask questions first? Yeah, we, we can we, we can do, it's free. Uh, you just have to um, say, say comments about the presentation or uh, you ha if you have doubts or if you want to ask some questions to Karini. And um, you, we, it's very free, okay? There's okay. no uh, rules, like strict rules for that. Okay, and you can also guide me uh, as as we go along if if I go astray. Okay. okay. <laughs> and so I I think it's um, a great timing for for this um, qualification exam, and so I I feel that Karina is uh, really at the right stage, at least in the United States, and how we do it. And so I wouldn't expect everything to be kind of fully fully formed or else you know we wouldn't have to have this exam <laughs> and so i think this is the perfect stage um uh for it and so 
Um, and I think uh, the preliminary data look excellent. And so I, I was really pleased uh, with the quality of, of the written portion of, of, that you submitted. And I thought this uh, presentation was excellent as well. And so the two really went well together. And I was very pleased with uh, how everything went. So Thank you. Uh, to start off with. And so, yeah, so I have a, I don't know how it traditionally goes there, but I do have a kind of a few related questions. And as other, maybe I'll start, uh, but- Yes, uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, and so maybe as other committee members kind of add their comments, uh, we can, uh, you know, work together to ask questions rather than uh, just me go, uh, I, I think it's a better idea. I, I like okay. this more dynamic. Yeah, yeah, dynamic and kind of us playing off of each other, asking kind of related questions because I thought the written portion of the exam uh, was great and I was able to see kind of how other committee members are thinking and how, uh, uh, and I think, you know, I'd like to ask questions on those portions as well and kind of play off of each other. Okay, great. And so, um, so in the written, um, in your written uh, portion of the exam where I asked you about the evolutionary steps that Brucella has undergone to become an intracellular pathogen, what was the key finding that stood out to you, Karina? I think I would, I would, I would say two key points. The first key point is the loss of some groups of genes that made Brucella uh, able to adapt in the inside environment of the as an intracellular pathogen, not a soil microbe. So this would be the first key point. And the second key point, I think it's the Virby mechanism that can allow Brucella to establish a chronic infection and a chronic persistent infection. And it can survive in the host organism from long time. So I think this would be the two points that I would remark. Okay, great. And so what can you tell me about how the process of genome reduction occurs? And so you talked about Ocrobacterium as having, you know, uh, one genome size and then Brucella as having another genome size, a reduced genome size. How does that process work? How do how did Brucella lose so many genes? Uh, I understand that in the way of the evolutionary process, Brucella adapts itself to act in a kind of relationship of it's not symbiosis, but kind of symbiosis. It interacts with the the host of the the organism host, and it can uh, magnify and optimize their functions with less genetic material so you don't need to have all this dna size it can be almost the, the same process uh in an economic way in the in this in the size of the the, gene, the dna i don't know if i i made myself clear yeah so you're you're getting at the question definitely and so you think it's a a question of economics i i yeah i understand that translation but um, optimizing yeah optimizing, optimizing yeah and so how, how, how does that work? How does optimization work in bacteria? And what are, I'm, I'm getting at what are the, I guess, selection pressures that encourage genome reduction? What's the benefit to Brucella for losing genes? I think the, the organism, the bacteria can adapt more can use some host cell function to to survive itself. So when it uses the host cell function, it don't have to have its own uh, its own genetic material. Understand? Uh, it can kind of optimize the the resources available inside the cell and express uh, their proteins and their biological process interacting with the host. Yeah, so, yeah, it's so not that's possible great. If it's a, a soil pathogen, environment pathogen, right? 
And so I get I guess my overall question is evolution about optimization or not? Is that the end goal or is that a does that happen by chance? What is what is the process of evolution that we're kind of thinking about? Can, can I didn't understand the question. Is so the main question is evolution really about optimization? Yeah, the most adaptive survive, right? <laughs> Certainly. Yep. <laughs> I, I think so. That's it's one way of looking at it. Look. Something happened and it becomes stronger and more adapted and it will be reproducing and replicating. So it comes. Yeah, and so I I think that certainly is part of it. I would also suggest that there's a good amount of chance in it as well, and that genome reduction and the loss of genes can be lost by you know basically genetic drift or random chance alone, uh, and so that may not be an optimized, completely optimized process. We're just uh, somewhat randomly losing genes, uh, certainly for some aspects of genome reduction. But yes, yeah. Yeah, when I say optimizing, it's like the, it's of course by chance, but only the, bene the benefit chance uh, perdure, you know? The, the, the chains, the drifts and the mutations that do not favor it, do not favor the bacteria, will not get along with, with the, the evolution, it will die or anything. Yeah, so so that's great. And so um, I, I kind of have, does anyone else want to jump in here? <laughs> I, have, I have more questions, but I'm, I'm open to having other people ask questions. And so in your, um, in your written part, you talk about the, LPS differences between the core or classic brucella and the atypical brucella. And so the core, I think, being the brucella that we normally think about, and the atypical being the ones from rodents and inopinata, BO1 and BO2. What's your interpretation of why there are LPS differences between the core brucella or classic brucella and these atypical brucella? I think that the classical brucellas are more adapted uh, in, in the way of surviving inside the host cells. And the atypical brucellas, um, it's kind of the middle of the way, you know? It's, it's not completely soil microbe, but it's not uh, that, do not have this refinement of adaptation. So I think it's, it's this, this kind of, thinking. Uh, I think Brucella atypical are not yet fully understood. We have only few represents. We have to, to found more of this and to, to perform whole genome sequence and to study their metabolisms and the, the physiology of the bacteria. But I think they are kind of less evaluated uh, in the evolutionary scale. They are, uh, I don't know how to say, they, they are not so adapted as Brucella. Yep. I, yeah, I, I think that's a great answer, perhaps because that's how I think of it as well. So maybe, maybe we're both correct or maybe we're both wrong. But uh, yeah, I, I, like, uh, I like that answer and it supports at least the data that I've seen. And so kind of related to this and um, it's, uh, you know, people here uh, you loosely use the terminology of living fossils. And so this idea that uh, there are forms that are exist now that are really more like the ancestors, but um, than they are to kind of contemporary samples. I, I hope that translates. It's actually kind of difficult to convey. Yeah, but I understand. Yeah, so, but lots of people have really talked about how this is really bad wording and that, you know, it doesn't really exist where you have the ancestors existing today. All you have are what exists today, right? And so 
kind of one of the questions and the way people, including me in the past and the other people in Brucella have really loosely worded um, Brucella evolution. And so I'm, I'm talking specifically about basal lineages. And so say you have a phylogenetic tree um, and you have branches that are say at the bottom of that tree, uh, people will call those and so as basal lineages or early diverging lineages. Does, does this sound familiar? Yeah. And so one would sometimes call the atypical brucella, the basal lineages and uh, the, um, the classic or core brucella as the derived lineages. And so in our heads, that makes sense, right? Because they're, the core brucella are more adapted uh, to hosts and the atypicals are not. Right. Yet, um, word, yeah, do you see any kind of problems with that approach and with that uh, terminology? Yeah, I don't think it's it's kind of a live fossil. I just think it's it's a bacteria that um, evolution did not kind of stop in this process of adaptation to host organisms. But I, I repeat, we don't know the other mechanisms of this bacteria. Maybe it had another differentiation of from Brucella, another advantage. I don't know. The, the, their genome, I, I think it's not fully elucidated. And we have some some studies that that report this with the Brucella uh, BO1, BO2, and but I, I don't think it's a live ancestral. I, I just think it's something happened that Brucella goes to one way and this kind of goes more slowly to another way of living, not uh, completely adapted to the host cell. Yeah. I just they, they they take some different ways. And Brucella take the, it faster than than these atypical ones. I would interpret it in this form. Yeah, and I I think you're right. And so I I you know your basic thing is that living fossils don't exist, right? Um, everything is here now, and it can't be a fossil. And so yeah, so that that's exactly right. And so I think one of the challenges, and we'll talk about this more when you get here, is that we we in very few cases can we go into the past, right? We can only sample from the present. Uh, there's a few exceptions to that. And so, um, but you know, in general, we can only collect current isolates. And so they're all at the same point of time in their evolution. And so we can't, we can't infer ancestry directly from living fossils. We can think, we can reconstruct how we think they're related to each other, but we don't have the ancestors. We only have what's currently present. And we can, yeah, we can make some, we can build trees and, and kind of make some uh, assumptions and uh, make some hypotheses about how different strains are related to each other and how they evolved over time. But in very few cases, do we have the ancestors? And so, yeah, I think that uh, you explained it well. And Sometimes so what we have is we collect the strain, we classify as Brucella, and then we, we just found out that it's not a typical Brucella. It's, it's this, this uh, different strains that we are talking about. I think it happened with an Australian, Australian strain, but it's kind of the interval of, I don't know, 50 years. It's not something rele relevant to the evolutionary process, right? Yeah, so what do you, what do you um, and anyone can jump in at any, anyone else can jump in at any time, but um, yeah, what do you make of, of all these new Brucella that are being discovered? And so I can say that, uh, there, so there's a new Brucella from a stingray, there's a new one, several new ones from frogs. There's a new one likely coming from snakes. There's a new one from bats. Um, there's a whole, there's about 20 new 
quote unquote species that are about to be published on uh, from a whole bunch of different hosts. Uh, what do you make of that? Sincerely, I think these Brucella are, they are different from the classical strains, but the, the main point is they are not that different. The, the point is the classical strains are so related with each other. The classical strains are so similar to each other. Some authors even discuss that it's a monospecific genus. So we are kind of, uh, I don't know, we are uh, acostumado. Como eu falo, Elaine? Used to. Yeah, yeah. we are you are used to mm -hmm. seeing Brucella uh, as uh, multiple species and everything. And when we, we, we saw a different Brucella, we say, oh, it's too different. It's not that different. It's because what we know, it's too similar, you know? <laughs> you understand this perspective? I, I think it's it's something like that. And the host preferences are the, the one of the main causes of this, this classification and everything. So the frogs, the bats, probably they are... We, are, we have a lot of things to discover and the, the whole genome sequence can provide this and enable this to, to become faster and better and with a more specific view and a more accurate view to future studies. So where do you think we should look ne next for more Brucella? What other hosts? What other host? I I don't I I really love field I really love field studies. I'm I'm kind of <laughs> the girl who loves to go to to collect animals in my lab. So I I don't know what we can search. I think sometimes we we don't search. It came to us like this pseudocrobacter strain. It was it goes to this whole genome sequencing and just it was a fatality and a luck I can say that we just identified. It was not something that we active search, like search it actively. It just uh, came to us, you know. <laughs> so uh, uh, a somewhat different question, um, but related to your talk, where does, um, we know that most Brucella don't have antibiotic resistance or any microbial resistance. They're nearly all Brucella are susceptible to uh, antimicrobials, uh, but we know that Ocrobactrum are not, right? And so we have this difference where, so where is this antibiotic resistance coming from in Brucella and what are the selection pressures that are creating it? Well, I this was firstly the, the main question of my project, my PhD project. What is responsible? Which mechanisms, which genetic determinants is responsible, are responsible for the, this phenotype that is recently observed? Uh, during my master degree, I performed a study with veterinarians that had uh, occupational brucellosis through the, the vaccine strains. And we saw a lot of reports of veterinarians telling us that they not prefer, uh, they not follow the correct prescription of treatment. And sometimes we can see the treatment of brucellosis is long, is with a combination of drugs, and people simply don't follow it in the right way. So it can relapse and we can select the, the, the bacteria to, to become resistant because we, we, we give a lot of drugs uh, for a long time. And sometimes when the treatment is discontinuous, uh, the resistance can, can occur, just like the other bacteria, like coli, salmonella, and everything. But brucella, we I think it's not that this is recently. It's because it uh, it's not very a lot of study because we need the biosafety level three and the, the whole genome is not we don't have, we don't know the, the same amount of genomes of Brucella and Coli. And so Brucella it's not yet fully understood. And uh, this is this is one of the, the main aims of this of, of my PhD to understand what's happening because I think it's because of the the pressure of selection and the long treatment and the people who don't follow the treatment just abandon because of their side effects and everything. So just to, to make sure I heard you correctly, you're saying that in Brazil, there is long-term tr antibiotic treatment of cattle for no, no, brucellosis? No, humans. I work with humans in my... Oh, okay. My uh, here, when we have positive animals, it's preconized the, the slaughter. We slot the positive animals. We ah, don't okay. treat them. But, so only but your strains are from cattle. 
My okay. friends are from Cairo, but uh, I think it's just a, a opportunity to them to be transmitted from Cairo to humans. So we have to to be worried in the same way, even if it's isolated from Cairo, right? So, I, I'm not worried about the the antimicrobial resistance directly in Cairo, but the the chances of this to be transmitted to humans. So you think that the antibiotic resistance or any microbial resistance is occurring where in humans or in cattle in cattle we have a problem we don't treat cattle from brucellosis but we treat cattle for a lot of disease like mastitis infections and so they are also uh under this this pressure of selection not because of brucellosis but because of the other disease and here in brazil you can buy any antibiotics even if without a veterinary perception so it make the the cases even more severe i don't know uh -huh. even it, it, it makes sense now i i didn't get that connection and so antibiotic treatment for other diseases are allowing for resistance uh within brucella yeah i think andre you want to say something yes please andre no, that point because she said that um the stop of treatment, the no compliance of treatment is in here, with the, the resistance in, in Brussels. But do you think really that that's a problem with the sample that you have in your hands, that the 53 strains that you have just sequenced? Can you repeat, Andre? You, ha you have said that uh, you think that the non compliance with the treatment, the stop of the treatment, uh, in humans could cause the Brussels to become resistant to drugs? I think in, in my strains, no, because the, the Brucella is mainly transmitted from cattle to human, not the contrary, right? But we, we could, for example, isolate some strains from human and observe this antibiotic, antibiotic resistance. But in, in the case of our strains, I don't think it's, it's because of it, because Probably the the infection uh, come in another route from cattle to humans and not the contrary. Yes, probably that's the point. I think that you start clarifying it in your yeah. answer to Jeff. But I think we have to be aware of this possibility because today we have the these notification procedures in in some states of Brazil. Bra brucellosis, human brucellosis, Jeff, is not a, a disease that. Uh, is need like an obligatory oh, notification. Yeah, compulsory notification. Uh, in Brazil, the human no, only in case of outbreaks. Uh, but in some states, some states like Minas Gerais, Santa Catarina, uh, it become uh, compulsory. And maybe it is the first step for isolation and study of these strains isolated from humans. And we can we can investigate this antimicrobial resistance um, also. We have this this collaborator, the Dr. Marcus from Instituto Emilio Ribas, who work, he's a physician and he works with brucellosis and he told us that there are many, many cases, cases of relapse and we don't know if these relapse are because of the, the characteristics of the brucella to be a persistent infection and to, to kind of hide from the immune system of the host or if it could be caused by antimicrobial resistance. We, we just have to I think it's it worth uh, a better investigation and I study. So maybe you can talk more about uh, that exactly. So how brucella hides um, and why it's called the stealthy pathogen. And so this was part of your answer to two other people's questions, but certainly um, I'm interested in kind of how you think of brucella as hiding and where it's hiding and how it's doing it. Brucella hides uh, inside the these dendritic, ce dendritic cells, phagocyte cells. It creates a vacuum containing brucella, and it kind of avoids the lysosome fusion and the the killing of the bacteria. Although uh, nine percent of these are killed, and ten percent can survive. And these ten percent who survive, they can express some mechanisms that allow them to be kind of not perceived by not view for, from the host immune systems. So uh, the, the conformational structures like the EPS from the outer membrane, the all polysaccharide chain, 
and the expression of the, the virulence factors are in all day together works something like a, a way to avoid the, the immune system to come back to the infection and to, to kill the bacteria. So what do you um, what do you account for the apparent host specificity or host preference of brucella? Why is brucella abortus typically found in cattle? And uh, and how can it jump to other species? And so why why is this occurring? Is brucella are the brucella species host specific? Or is something else causing them to be only found typically in in one host or the other? Uh, yeah, for sure, Brucella is as specific, specific to the host. It, they have their preferences. Uh, the jump can happen, like we can see melitensis in cattle, and we can see bottles in, in in humans and canis and everything. But I, I think the genetic basis of this host preference are not yet fully elucidated. I, I can be wrong, you can correct me, but I think they, they are not fully understand which are the genes or the group of genes responsible for this host preference. So how would you go about trying to figure that out? What would be your approach to figure out if there's a genetic basis for host specificity? I would compare the genomes, the genes that are in a strain but are are in the species, but not in other. The difference, the main difference between the, the species, something like I would discard the core genome that they are present in, in all, and they are for sure not responsible for that. And I will look for the the shared genome and the singletons, uh, not the singletons maybe because they are specific to a single strain. But I think I will I would take a look at the the shared genome or the genes that are present in a, in a species but are absent in another species. I would start with this this first step, but I, I it's the first time that I, I think about it. <laughs> All right. So, how would you account for the fact that you can infect just about any animal with just about any Brucella species if you try hard enough, right? And so we know that you know we know that Brucella suis is in general specific to pigs and abortus with cattle and melatensis with goats and sheep, uh, but uh, they all infect humans, for example. And we know that if we go into the Nile in Egypt, we can find catfish that are infected with the same strains that the goats uh, nearby are infected with. And so fish and goats have the same Brucella melatensis. So there's an apparent host specificity, but we see that it can jump hosts pretty readily. So is this adapted to hosts and does it have a preference or is it really something else happening? I think that it can be, it can be, we have a preference, Brucella have a preference, but it's not the exclusivity. I, I don't know how to say. It's preference, but not uh, compulsory or an obligation. It can adapt and there is a point that Brucella survives in the environment. So if the goats, I don't know, if the goats have a, a, a baby, I don't know how to say the, the baby of the yeah, goats. If the goats have a baby next to, to a river, for example, and the placenta are contaminated and everything, it could be affect the other animals. So the survival of Brussels in the environment for sure contributes for this jump of roast hosts. I think it's it's probably an, an important issue. Jeff, can I ask something else? Yes, please. Uh, Kaina, put in mm -hmm. that context, in the evolution and the host preference and so on, how do you look at Brussels all of this? How do I look at Brucella ovis? Yes, concerning the, its genome, its host preference, uh, the evolution, and so on. Brucella ovis had this, this characterized that it's not uh, a zoonotic like the other ones. So some, some people, I think uh, Renato used some, this, this species to try to develop some vaccine that are not virulent to humans and everything. But uh, Brucella ovis for sure have some particularities that do not 
allow it to to case infection in humans, but I I I did not go deeper in the in their characteristics. But for sure, there is something uh, related to this not zoonotic aspect. It's not only that because as long as I remember, it it was only isolated from uh, sheep, uh, natural infected sheep. And its genome, it's it's one of the the um, smallest ones. They it has a lot of pseudogenes, and uh, in that evolution that we were trying to discuss before, probably it's in the, in another uh, point of the evolution of Brucella. We have some strains that like Brucella obvious and we have I think Brucella Swiss Biovar five that have only one chromosome. It's Biovar five. We have this. Uh, they are classical, but have these atypical behaviors related to, to the genetic repertory and the host preference. Um, yeah, I think each one of them deserve uh, a deeper understanding. It's, yes, it's a Roth one. It's different from the most of the other cell and so on. Yeah, great question, Andre. <laughs> Do you have more questions, Jeff? Uh, not for now. I'll, uh, I may ask more questions later as this goes on, but those were my main ones to start. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you for your questions. And I think uh, were very nice discussions about the mucellosis and the evolutionary process. And um, I would like now to invite uh, Dr. Marcos Canares uh, to ask her, to have Karin to ask Karin questions about the document, about the chapters, or about the question that he sent to Karin before. Please be free, Marcos, to ask her questions that you think it's important. Okay. Thank you again Thank you. for accepting. Thank invitation. you. Thank you for the invitation. So uh, I wrote some topics and, and I can send you after the, the qualification pro, uh, process. So about the, these questions that Jeff was asking you, the last um, definition of bacteria species that I read was a group of bacteria that has a, that is monophyletic. So they have some uh, genetic cohesion, so monophyletic. And they have the same ecological niche. So you said that in the literature, some author says that Brucella actually is a, just one species and we separated them because of the medical and veterinary um, issues. So um, and you can see that the same species can infect, for example, cattle and humans. Maybe they are just the same. Uh, you could consider them the same species. They don't have this uh, host specificity. They just don't have the same uh, opportunity to if, to be like close to more than one uh, host. So that's why it's more common, for example, in pigs because their ancestors of the let's say Brucella suis found some pigs. So they have like they are circulating in, the, in that population, but they can infect another host too. And then when the humans just starting to uh, breed pigs, then these species could be transmitted to humans. So maybe they, are, they can be the same species. There is no dead host specificity. They just, it's just some, uh, let's see, as I said, not geographic, geographical uh, bar barriers that make some populations more, let's say, genetically different. Or maybe these differences are just by chance, just genetic drifts. So you can do, you can develop some markers to identify some of these Brucella suites, for example. And, but they actually, suits and melitensis can have the same hosts. They're just different, just be, because of, uh, let's say, by chance, some mutations that separated population, but actually they would, they would be the same species. So that, that, is, that is a commentary that I can tell about them because in this, um, Definitions that I that I read about species, you you could 
you should uh, find a population that is monophyletic, different from the other, and then have the same ecological niche. So if you find the genetic uh, mechanisms or genetic variations that are associated with some host range, then you could say, for example, so these species have these ecological niches or these hosts, and this is a real species because, of course, we have the genetics and the ecology. So we don't elucidate this yet for Brucella. So maybe they don't have this specificity, or maybe some of them have and some don't. So that is, uh, no, I, will, I will go back for this when I'm, when I'm, when I'm in the suggestions here. I will, just, I will just follow the order here. Okay. So in the first, um, so for the manuscript, you, I know that you will use it for the thesis. So I suggest you to put each article as a chapter because you just put the, like one text, uh, let's say next to the other, but you don't say, for example, chapter one. So you can just go do this in the, for the thesis. Okay. So for the first uh, paper, you said that you discovered that that the strain uh, 150 was actually pseudocrobactrum. And then you do the ANI, the average nucleotide identity analysis to confirm this. But you didn't uh, tell how do you, how you found the, the, the correct species first, because you didn't uh, try any of the, you didn't try like a lot of the genomes first you just you just I did a search first then mm -hmm. you found the closest genome then you do the the any average nucleotide analysis so you didn't put that information so how do you find it was yeah, yeah actually we did that together right that's why i'm yeah, smiling because you did that to me with me uh we used patrick to to find the the most similar strains the possible species that we yeah, downloaded the read from patrick and and that's the way we direct the analysis of average nucleotide identity. Yeah. yeah. Because first you, you use the, the Patrick, but you didn't put that in the- In the manuscript. Uh, in the manuscript. Mm -hmm. So maybe someone is just, oh, you, 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 you could prove it, that mm -hmm. it was a, from that species, but you didn't tell- How did they how get do, there, How right? do you find it? How, 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 yeah, that was missing. And, and then you use the this average nucleotide identity and to evaluate it was uh, more than 95%. But what I suggest you is using a type strain. Because for example, you can say that that strain that you found in the database is the same species as yours because it has more than 95% identity. Okay, but what if the person that deposited this genome just put the wrong taxonomy on it, you know? <laughs> It the happens. CCUG is the type of strain, the SM not. So, so the other one that you use is a type strain. The CCUG that I use yeah. in the yeah. phylogenetic tree is a type of strain, yeah. Okay, so that's, I just saw that CCUG, but may, sometimes people just put, I, I saw uh, in previous works that some uh, someone just deposit the wrong uh, species. Like the strain was correct. <laughs> if you get the, the, the name of the strain in, in Google it, for example, you will find the, the 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 strain was correct, but the species was wrong, so it it happens. Maybe you just the type strain, but someone just put because you're you you believe in the in the database. Maybe you have to 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 just check that first. It but, happened but, when I when I did the tree. The the I I retrieved the the strains from Kumar, and in the article sometimes uh, the the strain was reported if a. Uh, uh, as I species. And when I retrieved this strain from NCBI, it was already with another name of species. Probably it would, it was oh. reclassified from 2009 to today. Hmm. This, I think this is because of this type of error that you are talking about. Yeah, yeah because I, I worked with uh, population genetics and conservation. So the first thing is to check the taxonomy of your samples. First thing. So, for example, I did it. I didn't. I didn't do this at the last analysis. So I, I just came back and I was running like for one week, and then I just did this. I just got the, the sent my genomes for the for taxonomic analysis. One of them was not even the same genus. Other was uh, a synonym. So the name was the this species was different, but actually it was the same. Just changed the, the name. So I had to go back and uh, delete everything that I did. And, 
remove that sample and do it again. And even as I'm telling you, even if the 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 identity values is compatible with the same species, you can say that both samples are the same species. But the one that you are using uh, as a reference, you have to check if that that came from that same species, maybe because you're just believing in the person that submitted the genome. So uh, continuing here, the access numbers you didn't use, didn't put in this manuscript. You didn't um, publish, can I say, uh, liberal access? How, how do you? Yeah, no, uh, we are thinking about uh, make it public uh, only when we publish the articles. Okay. But but, they, are but already, can... they are already deposited, but they are kind of close or high. I don't know how to say. When it, mm -hmm. And when we publish the first article, we will uh, make it uh, available for yeah. public because we, we we want to to have this exclusivity to make the all the analysis that we are interested in and then uh, get them from other studies or and other researchers to to work with it if they mm -hmm. want to Marco, okay. let, me, let me do a comment on that uh, anyway Karim, you, you must specify and make it clear which is the accession number of each of the strains that you uh, you use you know, because uh, you have you have to let it clear in your manuscript. They are in the table one, oh, or table one or table two. Yeah, I don't you know. use the bio sample and the bio project. You didn't yeah, use the access not number. It's not clear in your material and methods. It's in the table. Yes, but yes it's have... in the table. It's in the end of the, the chapter, and it's. I not... mean, then in the, the nexus. Yes. Supplementary file. Yes, it, it, it's, it's just to make it clear which is the session number of each of the things. So can I ask where you're planning to submit chapter one? As soon as possible. I think my chronogram is 10 in April, but we, we have to discuss if some future analysis are necessary or if this is enough, but in my chronogram, we are planning to uh, April. <laughs> and to what journal? Um, veterinary microbiology. Okay. All right. Thanks. Jeff, Jeff. It, it depends uh, from uh, the drives that the, this committee are going to make to us. We are. Yeah. Uh, we want to discuss with you what type of analysis we could do because we have some problem to have more uh, sequences from the pseudo prographic to compare to do phylogenomic analysis and. Uh, this is one of the points that one we want to discuss with you, all of us. Sure. Uh, I know that, but uh, anyway, I think uh, even for a genome announcement or so, something like that, you need to put more data on your results. What you find in the genome? What kind of genes? Uh, and some of the things that you put in your further uh, things to do in chapter two, you also must do in chapter one to, to have something finish. At least what I think. Yeah, uh, uh, it, that's, uh, the Professor Alain and me, we discussed that about characterizing the whole genome sequence because we used the uh, 16S and the HIC-A, but we didn't tell any, any further information about the whole genome sequencing. So maybe we could perform some analysis of genomic island and everything, but we have this limitation that is, we don't have any closed genome. So some programs we can, we're not able to, to, to use, to analyze. And we have this, this article from last year that it, we, it was reported 13 isolates from pseudocrobactrin in Europe uh, and we asked the, the authors for the, the assembly, and uh, I think they, they did not reply, reply yet, but we have the, the reads, and we have the team to, to assembly, and maybe we can just pick the reads and, and do it ourselves to use it in the analysis. Maybe we can perform a phylogenomic analysis because we only did this with the, the two genes, and I think the, the 16S gene do not provide a good resolution because of the low bootstrap number, and heck e okay but maybe we could make it more detailed and more robust if we use phylogenomic analysis 
Anyway. And it's also interesting to, to do like you, you are suggesting, Andri, to characterize the genome in a deeper way uh, and to at least um, do not only classify as the qualitative, the quantitative uh, measures, but uh, point some, some functions and, and yeah. perform some, some analysis to, to the functional way and to the, the, the mainly difference, for example, of Pseudocrobacter and Drusella, what we can, we can see of difference of resistance island, metabolic island, symbiotic islands, maybe you would be interested. The thing is, you put the whole genome or genome in your title of the chapter, and you didn't discuss anything. You, you just say you have some uh, uh, RNA uh, codons and so on, but you, you can go even if you don't have any other sequence to compare to. You you can just look at the your data or genome that you have and say what are you seeing there. Yeah, we intend to do that. Okay. Do, would you suggest some, some specific analysis, Jeff, Marcus, Andre, or Professor Vasco? What do you what do you think that would be important to, to show in this genome? Yeah, I think another key, key point, Karin, is uh, should we um, use the reads that come for, um, make available to do that, it's um, it worth uh, make the assembly and the whole analysis using the genomes that are available, not the genomes, but the reads that are available from other um, pseudocobactive streams. Uh, this is the question that I would like you to help us to answer because we, for do more deeper analysis, would be better if you have more strains or we can, we can do another analysis that we need not um, take these strains from this analysis. So I, I think that you could you could expand the, the work because the, the the main goal was actually the I remember that that you you said that there was a strange Brussels in your samples. So then you discovered it was another uh, species from another genus, and then you just wanted to show that. But you can, for example, at, at least you can uh, put the um, this raw data because uh, last uh, paper that I sent the the, the journal why why you were laughing <laughs> is because of the mask. Okay, so the the last uh, paper that I submitted the journal asked me for the raw data to deposit it, so not, not just the, the genome, and maybe you can compare it for uh, to another. Uh, G genomes for the same species, because you said that it was the first one in Latin America, right? So, is there some difference between them? The HT sequence type, you can do something, maybe because the main focus of your project is the Brussels board, not this one. This was just a lucky, it was just like you have some really strange thing, but you can do that if you want, just compare to another, to the other Alcobacter and say if there's some, at least in the ST. Actually, you can do a lot of, uh, of things, but it, it could just, uh, how can I say? Oh, that's, I forgot the word. Atrapalhado, uh, the main focus, you can lose your main focus if you do that. But I would say the raw data and uh, maybe some comparison of to identify strains that are from these species from Brazil, you can do at least an MLST. So you can see this ST is specific from from here. Uh, and about the phylogeny, you use the 16S. So with this marker, you had 100% confidence, bootstrap, for species from the same genus. Okay, but when you go to the species level, you cannot have, the, you, you don't have that. You just have like less than 60%. And uh, I don't remember exactly uh, the justification for that, but we consider less than 70 as uh, a good measure. So uh, for 16S, you can you, you can be sure about the genus, not the species. So, but with the other gene, you, you can have that. You, you have like 100%. It was just, it clustered, your species cluster with the other 
strain from the same species with 100% confidence. So maybe just the, the, this gene is enough. Just yeah, the yeah, yeah. A is enough. 100% of identity also in BLAST. Yes, that's it. Oh, so you use BLAST too? Yeah, the the numbers, uh, it's not in the uh -huh. presentation, uh, in the in the manuscript, but in the presentation, I, I put the number, uh -huh. the percentage in, in blue. Yeah. And I performed the BLAST uh -huh. to understand the identity of the, the, the similarity of the, the sequences. Uh -huh. Yeah, because for 16S, we use 97% as the same species. Cut yeah, off. 16 is not a good, a good gene to, to understand yeah. the family. Yeah, yeah, it depends on the organism, actually. Maybe for Brucella, they are not, if we talk no. about Brucella, they are so close to each other, maybe it doesn't. The same bootstrap yeah. values, the, this, these low bootstrap values were also observed in Camphor in 2009. Uh, it's it's they're not too accurate, but with hack in mm -hmm. with hack gene, with hack a gene, it, we can improve it, this resolution and be sure of the the classification at species level. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now the next one, uh, the pan genome. So as I said, oh, Marcus, I think I uh, think Jeff, I want to say something. Oh yeah, so. I just have one thing to add. There's uh, there's two papers. You cited one of them. There's an Ashford paper from that just came out um, that I think has really good information about some ways that you can approach the analyses. And so I think you could use some of that framework for your analysis and for ideas. And there's a paper from 2019 from Leclerc. Um, uh, on kind of the taxonomy of the family Brucellaceae using phylogenomics. And so between those two, I think there's kind of good material about how you can approach kind of phylogenomics of, of this group and to identify where your isolate falls into it. I think we have wrote for to Ashford, not Karin. Yeah, we wrote to Ashford. Yeah, asking him about the strains, the assemblies. Because this this misidentification, uh, uh, it was already reported in the United, United Kingdom. Uh, some Brucella, some Pseudocrobactum were isolated from animals, and the first suspect of the veterinary was Brucella. And when they performed the the PC, the sequence of the genes, they understand that it's actually pseudocrobactum. So they they almost uh, commit the same mistake that uh, we we commit when we isolate the strain. The first step is Brucella, and then we could identify the correct um, classification as pseudocrobactum. So I think probably it causes the same clinical symptoms, and it can be cross reactions in some tests. But it doesn't react with the IS-711 assays, do you know? Yes, it was negative in the MSPCR. Okay. Yeah, it was, yeah. What, uh, the genus specific, it was an amplification, but the, the MSPCR did not have any, any, it was a negative result. Okay, sorry, Marcus, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so second paper. As I told you before, you should check the taxonomy of the 21 genomes from NECB, the complete ones. Um, and one more time, the access numbers, because you put the biosample. In the, uh, when you use the genomes from NCBI, you put the uh, access numbers, genome access numbers. But for uh, yours? Access numbers, I don't, I even, I only have when I, I make them free, or no, I... you can you can check the 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 NCBI, the gene bank page. You, you will see the access numbers there. Okay. I did this for my for the, my last paper too. And for example, about the 543 genes that you found only in Brazil strains, you didn't put that in the results. You put it in the discussion one, I think. Because you didn't, yeah. You you say that in the discussion that you found this more than 500 genes, but in the, it should be in the results first. Yeah. 
all the comparisons okay. I put only in the discussion, including yeah. this gym. But but I think no it, you are right. I, I should. Yeah, you, you should, should see correct. That. And I, because usually in plan genome you have to f say for this is the core, this is the single, this is the, you just sit a lot of numbers. So just put that one too. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. And you can use these numbers uh, as, as you said as marker genes for the Brazilians one, but uh, as all of these four, 543 geno genes are not present in all of the Brazilians genomes, right? Right. That's that's exclusive from Brazil, but not doesn't mean that everyone has it. Everyone no, from Brazil has it. Genome, not at core genome. So, yeah, but 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 what I say is that maybe some of subset of these 500 something, let's say 20, 100 of them are exclusive from Brazil and shared by all of all of them. So that would be your markers for yeah. Brazilian strains. And about the uh, sequ uh, sequence typing, you didn't do that. Right, and any LST for them? Maybe you just find yeah, something that uh, is just actually for we we I received the results. I have the these these students that are helping me with the the, mm -hmm. the studies, and we perform the in LST. Uh, it was available yesterday. It was they are they are already mm -hmm. available, and we we intend to perform a chapter only to compare the methods of diagnosis like MLVA. MS, uh, MLST, whole genome, SNPs, and everything, mm -hmm. but it's in a kind of a separate chapter, but we intend to do that on the MLST mm -hmm. uh, 21 so, and also the core MLST. So you're saving for, my, for another paper? Yeah, it's like it's okay. something like the future perspective, but I I, uh, I didn't write the, this chapter yet. Okay, so you can, as I said, you can, uh, as you told me, you can find uh, genetic markers using the accessory genome. So if you find uh, from these genes, which ones, from the accessories, which ones are shared by all of them, you can have your markers. And okay, and now the G-gene is, you said that you are going to use it for the phylogeny, phylogenomic tree. Yeah. But I had a problem with this software because it, it just removes the core genome and use the accessory genome to, to build the, the tree. But you can, lead you some for how can I say it can bias the, the the phylogeny for example i did an analysis with some strains from buffalo i, I cannot I, I don't need i don't need to give all the details but there are some strains from buffalo from these species that have a specific phage profage so they, that's what uh this is what separate them from horses uh strains so what happened uh I don't know why, but it looks like in, when they are uh, doing the culture media for, for extracts DNA, it looks like some phages were just disappeared, just went out of the genome. So when we sequenced it, it was, they were not there. But we know that they, they, they were. What, what happened? Because of these genomes lack this, uh, this phage, when we sequenced, DGNE just put these this strains that are from Buffalo next to the horse ones. So because of they don't have, because art, let's say it was a, a let's say artif artifact, sequence artifact, Let, let's say something mm -hmm. happened that the phages just go went out. But the phages is one of the markers from this host. So as these two, it was 10 strains. So from two of them, the phages just went out and were sequenced and DGNs, because they lack the phages, the DGNs just clustered them with the other strains on horses. So, but I know it, they came out from horses, you know. But when I use another uh, 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 software that uses the core genome, then it got got it right. So even if the that two strains lack the, the phages, but they were um, in the correct cluster. So you, maybe you should use another uh, another. Yeah, maybe, um, I software. have already performed some pre preliminary results in the genes, and the the main problem that I observed it's there two. It's kind of almost identical, and the G genes could not will not be able to to separate them and to allow a good resolution view of this. And now we are trying to perform phylogenomic, and we are starting to to use Busco to to do all this mm -hmm. this as a first step, né, for the phylogenomics with Brucella botus, including Busco. our strains and the 21 and CBI closed genome strains. Okay. 
But Busku, I know it is used for check how the completion of your genome. If it's yeah, it's, it's it depends on the family actually, the the taxonomic family it has a, a data bank, and if check if your assembly has all of the how much genes, let's see, you have in your assembly. But I didn't know it was it could be used for phylogeny. Yeah, and so, that's why we are using only close, complete genomes, only the the uh -huh. genomes that have no gaps and are. Complete. Okay, but but in this case, if I use it, Busco for this case that I told, Busco wouldn't find it because it will check, for example, from the Corine bacteriaceae family, and but this phage is not from the core genome, so it I wouldn't get it. So I, I think you should use a, a phylogenetic method that use the core genome, not the, the the variations in the core, not the accessory, or you can use both. Actually, you can. I think each one will give you another a different answer. So one is the species, uh, the phylogeny of the core genome, and the other one is the phylogeny of the accessory genome, for example. Mm -hmm. some, I think it, they, uh, there are different uh, questions. Do you have another uh, uh, question, Jeff? Hmm. No, okay, so, keep going. Okay. So about the, the, the other one, the resistome, um, so you, you repeat the methodology of sequencing and assembly. I think because the first one, you will uh, you will submit both papers. Uh, maybe the first one that is uh, accepted, you just take off this method for for the other one because you you cannot have the same thing in these two papers. Yeah, so, I yeah. probably I would just cite, but as there are yeah. different chapters and I didn't publish any of them, I mm -hmm. just repeat. Yeah, you see, previously we isolated, you see something like that. We isolated this 50 genome from Brazil, and then you cite the first one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you want to use, uh, actually you already use power snips. You use a reference genome, and then you align your genomes to this reference. So you have these nips, and then you get the phenotypes for the resistance, and then you do your analysis to identify the um, variation that could be associated for the to the resistance. But there are some limitations. There are some limitations. First one, that you, you are using a reference genome. So you will analyze only the sequences that this reference genome has. So uh, there was another, can I say other methods? The, for example, uses scanners. Uh, I tried to use that in the lactobacillus, but I couldn't find anything interesting. So in this uh, method, based on KMERS, it gets all of your genomes, and they, as as, as if genome was a, a let's see, a sequencing data, and they try to assemble. Uh, let's say you have 53, 53 genomes, right? Yeah. So it creates a, a graph like everything. You, you, let's see, everyone. How can I say? How can I explain that? It generates a debrewing graph. I don't know if you studied this for the assembly algorithms. Uh -huh. So it connects all of them as it creates a graph that represents all the 53 genomes, just one graph. In each, in every, in every position where the genomes are, are different from each other, it just splits. So as it, every node is a, a, a variation on this graph. So then it uses this graph plus your phenotype, phenotypic data, and then it do the analysis of association. So in this case, you can you cannot use you you sh, can I say you're not limited to a, a reference genome, and you can find a variation in any part of the genome because you use it uh, a reference genome and known genes, genes that you are know you already know that they are associated with. Um, with with resistance so you have this limitation analysis, this analysis they generate a, a data bank or only this this graphical view it's it get all of the genomes it generates a, a graph that represents the variation of all genomes let's say only two of them has some some sequences so you have this node in the graph or some snips so actually it uses scanners not snips is just a, yeah, but, but a, you know, you know a, a data a data bank or only this graph view it generates this graph this graph and uses your phenotype 
data to, to do this um, uh, DD analysis. So you don't need a database. Mm, it, will, okay. it will it will tell you, for example, this k is associated with resistance to this. Mm. Uh, and then you go to the, it offers a, an annotation. So you can see where, for example, is this in a genome? Is this a, in another, where, where is this thing? So that it's a little more complicated because you have a graph, uh, uh, I'm gonna say, uh, uh, yeah, a graph instead of uh, just a genome, annotated genome. It's a little bit complicated, but you're not limited to a, to a data bank, like to information that you already know. So it was this, it's the, pro, the software is called DB, DB GWAS, like D Brewing GWAS. It was published in 2018. So I, I will, I'm curious to use that. Maybe I can run it. It runs very, very fast. If you, if you have the genomes. To, different, to differentiate Brucella species, no. I read a, a paper. Uh, that perform GWAS to, difference, to differentiate the genes from each Brucella species. And I was thinking about maybe perform this, but uh, with an intention to differentiate between the phenotypes of antimicrobials that we have this mm -hmm. information. So, but so I, you can. The same paper, it's, it's from 2008. Also. Yeah, so you can use this uh, instead of, um, let's see, you, you have. Two phenotypes, resistance or not, or, or you could no, just I have, I also have the intermediate. Yeah, I have the intermediate. Yeah. So let's see. Let's say you have the the first step is to have generate this graph, and then you have generate a table with the phenotypes from each column. And uh, for example, you could say that the phenotype is being Brucella abortus. It is. Then you put one. It is not. Then zero. And then the the other column would be the other species, and so on. So you have Jeff say that will be. 20 species, like in the next, maybe this year. So you have, for example, 20 columns. Each one is as the species was the phenotype. Like, is this a species or is not? And then you generate the same, you could do the same analysis. Instead of uh, resistance, it, it would be taxonomy. You could do that too. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Let's explore. And Jeff, another, another question? I, I like your comments about the selective pressures and the genetic drift. So, four suggestions for a future analysis is the reverse vaccinology. And actually, I saw some papers about with Brucella species, but you have more than then they, they have like more genomes. So you can maybe you can have better results. So reverse vaccinology uh, in identification of drug targets. The Vasco lab do this a lot, so you could do that. Maybe not for this thesis, but for a future paper. Yeah, we have a partner, Professor Luis, that is conducting yeah. the reverse personology with a, a master degree. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And they are performing this study about reverse personology of, with our 53 mm -hmm. students. Okay. And the other one that, uh, that I used in my previous thesis was the positive selection analysis. So you have... Um, Let's say you get one species or one genome from each species that you are trying to, uh, that you want to analyze. And then you do a test uh, uh, with the, a statistical test to check if there is some uh, selection that, for example, to change a codon in a specific position, change an amino acid in a specific position of a, uh, of a gene that happens only in your, in the group that you are analyzing, for example, you have the 12 species of Brucella, so you put the 12 genomes, and then you want to check, for example, if there is some Brucella abortus uh, in the protein sequences of Brucella abortus. It doesn't matter if it's a core genome or not. Uh, if there is some selective pressures to change some amino acid that happens only in this species. So it would be a, a, a suggestion of an, of an adaptation that happened, not just genetic drift, maybe because for, for example, you can say that, well, for, for example, um, the ancestors, the common ancestor of all the abortus have this mutation, but it doesn't mean that it's an adaptation. It just can be just by uh, uh, genetic drift. But this analysis theoretically will show you the positions where the uh, selection um, happened to change this amino acid and to fix it. So you can uh, find things that you were never expecting instead of just 
being limited for one or two geno genes that you already know. So actually, I want to do this. I have this table of the genomes that are to analyze since like three years ago. Yeah, maybe, you... we can, maybe we can, hey, I showed you, maybe we can do that in the, for the next week. Yeah. Do okay, you think so it, that... probably it will, would work not with species, but with phenotypes, like to susceptibility to antimicrobials? It would be... this, this kind of analysis uh, requires monophyletic groups. So that's why uh, you have to, it depends on the analysis. If it's GWAS, it should not be like that, not monophyletic group. But in this case, this analysis requires monophyletic uh, target groups so that the, they can compare the mutations, the, the number of mutations that happens in your group in comparison to the other group. Mm -hmm. So for phenotype, I don't think, it, because being resistant for a, a, a specific anti anti microbial it's not a mono it's not doesn't require monophil monophilism that's mm -hmm. why it, it cannot work but there's another type of of analysis that can do that but i didn't find a software that can do this in the genomic level just gene by gene and then you can do that for example you put 10 uh samples that are uh, from samples that are resistance against 10 that are not so th there is a software that do this but just one gene at a time so we, yeah. maybe we can find someone that could do a pipeline for us. So that's my all my suggestions. Thank you, Marcus. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. We are going to bother you from the next days for him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. uh, so now I would like to thank you, Professor Andre, that has been a partner for a long, long time and uh, is helping us, Karine, in your uh, master's and now in your PhD project. And also, Dr. Andre is who uh, conducted the first project that generated this project now, because one of his students, uh, Sylvia, uh, isolated uh, these strains in the 2008, I think so. And then we are doing a lot of projects using these strains. And then I, I talked with Dr. David O'Callaghan, who helped us to sequence these strains. And now Dr. Vasco is helping us in all his team to work with these genomes. So Andre is part of this project uh, in the beginning. I have working with him for almost 15 years. So we have a long, long, long partnership. And thank you, Andre, for being here again. Thank you. Karin, is all yours. <laughs> okay, thank you, Elaine. Uh, Karina, uh, first of all, how, how long have you started your PhD? I started in August 29. 29, wow. August 19, sorry. Okay. okay. Kind of half year, but in the first semester, I focus on publish my master, my master degrees articles, and to do the disciplines. I only start to working in these genomes on February, on February first last year. So I took almost eleven months to to obtain the complete and whole genomes and deposit it on NCBI, and then perform the analysis. Yes, that's a question I have asked uh, Elaine before, because uh, uh, I think it's quite satisfying the evolution you had uh, with the mounting of the genome and so on. And you, you now you're just starting to dig inside the data you have and look uh, deeper in what you can find there. Well, uh, I don't have a lot of questions, but uh, I have some comments, in fact. When I look at everything that you had written, the first thing that uh, caught my attention was your aims. If, if it, it was me to write the aims, I think I did it in a completely different way. You put your first aim as the classification or identification of a pseudocobactin uh, strain that 
it's something that happened in your project. It was not the first aim. Yeah. What in reality is your first aim? It's what, very characterized. What's the question that you try to answer when you start this project? Yeah, I think related to Pseudoprobactrum, the, the main aim is to first avoid men's di misdiagnosis that could have a huge impact, mainly in some regions like the top fibrocellulosis regions or regions that advances in the control of the disease. So I think the main the main aim of the pseudocobactum chapter is the correct diagnosis. It's not the pseudocobactum uh, thing. I'm For all the whole, the whole project that you're conducting. Ah, uh, okay. Well, I think it's to characterize the genome in order to join and associate this with the epidemiological data. And when I have this association, I probably could use this in designing strategies to to be applying the prevention and control of results. Your first question. What? Was it really your first question? The first first question was why antimicrobial resistance occurs. That why we sequence only the antimicrobial uh, resistance strains. Is this the first first question? You know why I'm insisting on that? Because I will completely reverse the order of the your yeah, aim. Because because I, I, I aim is what are the genetic determinants of the uh, antimicrobial resistance in Brussels? That's the first yeah. What you have what is the, the whole genomes, the comparison of genomes, pan genome, and so on, and the, the pseudocobac. Those are things that are. Uh, uh, Bonus. The, the first one is something that you, you have to prepare to do the, your first. That's the. Try, try to find where, where, which are the genes that are involved in uh, antibiotic resistance in your cell. And. The uh, pseudocobactin thing is something that happened, uh, that occurred when you look at it. We know that it's a different strain. Uh, since the time that we performed the, uh, the resistance uh, approach, we didn't include the, the, the resistance paper because you find it completely different from the other uh, strains. And probably you have some other strains that are, are also different. I remember yeah, the data, the data, data no, mix. No, no, not the ones that you have, but you have some strains that we isolated from cattle and swine in Pantanal, from Mato Grosso do Sul, that are also different. Probably uh, they are alcohol. I think they are not Brussels, Andrew. I, I, I saw data, data it was negative for HIC8, and I kind my my eyes shine to 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 know about this species. But uh, that's the data bank from I think from Sylvia that I extracted the information from Sylvia. They were negative for HIC A gene. Yes. Is here. I think that's the, the strains where you are talking about. Yeah. So we have a, a really difficult time to identify some of the strains, mainly those from the Russian Uh But uh, what I'm trying to say is that. Uh, the approach that they're doing, I think there are aims to reverse. That means your first question, main question is, which are the genes that are involved in, in the microbial resistance in the cell? And I think you can rearrange everything to have that in focus. It's, it's not to say that you uh, should uh, drop the other things, but they are important, quite important. But I think the most important question that we have is just on the microbial resistance. You know? And that, that's a, a, a vision of our work. That, that, that's uh, just uh, because I, I'm talking about the English. I think it, it's a way to look at what are you doing. Sometimes we found some interesting things, like the, the strains that I told you, like SP7 and VA96. And, and we kind of, we have to, to be aware of investigating this without losing the focus of antimicrobial resistance. Yes, I know that all, all data that came from the analysis that we're doing right now with the genomes and so on. 
But uh, one of the main questions, that, the question that started the, the project mm -hmm. is, is the relation between the genomic genes and uh, antimicrobial resistance in the soil. Yeah, I appreciate I know for a fact you sought to have found some uh, specific genes, then you see that is not the case. And just trying to figure out how to dig in the genomes you have to find which are the genes that are important to that antimicrobial resistance. Well, when I look at the separated papers, Elena asked a question, uh, and also Jeff asked it, what do you think uh, where you're going to publish the pseudocobactin things and um, what do you need to finish that paper? I think there are some points in that paper I had already said that, uh, but there's mainly three points in that paper that I think it would be worthwhile to discuss and in, to improve the paper. First of all, to discuss, I know that we don't have a lot of literature on that. Your audio is, is low to me. Yeah, yeah, it's very it's low and we can hear you very well. I try to, to speak a little bit uh, slower. No, I think it's, it's, it's not it's the mic your microphone. It's the microphone. That's not good. Uh, okay. I will try to, to speak louder. Can you hear? It? It's better. Yeah. Or not? yeah. Uh, for, for the first paper, since you have three points that you have to, to check to finish the paper. The first one, I know that you don't have a lot of data on pseudocobactin, but you have to discuss better and uh, try to put more data in the introduction, which are the strains you have, where they are isolated, what kind of a pathology they are associated with or not. And I see that's important to put, to put uh, that information in the context that you can discuss what you have found. Second one, I think you should uh, look for more information on the strain you have, where they are isolated, from which kind of animal, if you have some some um, some more information on the animal farm and so on. We don't have. I, I don't remember if it was isolated by. Sea. We don't have. Well, yes, plus. it was isolated by her, but. We try to find some more information, but we don't have Andre. Okay. Andre, a limitation I, of this, this the, a limitation of this gene, I think it's the the articles are mainly focused on taxonomy and they do not they do not go deeper in the epidemiological characteristics. So all I know is that it was already isolated from a knee, from a man and from a bovine, but they don't give us uh, this this kind of detail. So I think they are mainly focusing on the, the taxonomy and the... I know, this, this I know. Of even that is lacking in the introduction of the paper, and I think it could be used in the discussion also. Okay? Uh, and the third thing is, uh, you say something about the genome, but you didn't show really what you have in the genome to the product. Even you can uh, you can compare with uh, some other genomes. You can use what you see there, how many genes you have, how many kind of genes you have, uh, to describe at least uh, uh, how to describe the description of what you see in that genome. And then I think you have a paper that could be submitted. For the, sorry. Sorry? Did, did I'm not I... hearing you. It's, it's kind of cutting. Uh, I said that then you have a paper that could be submitted. Okay. Then I will have the paper. Okay. For the other uh, two, two analysis of papers, I think you, you, even for the pandemics, I have put some a uh, lot of questions in your discussion. 
that I think you could uh, better analyze the data. Uh, I dropped some moments here because the internet dropped, but I think you were discussing that with Marcos and Jeff. Uh, I think there's some analysis that could be done and uh, the data from the genomes can, should also be presented. You, the only thing that you can see is what you can see. Is the three different graphics that you show which genes are single tones and so on. And I think you have a much more uh, analysis that could be done and analyzed and uh, yeah. reported and better discussed. Yeah. Uh, I th I th I the right time, as uh, Jeff uh, had already said, because you have time to dig inside it, go deeper in the analysis, understand better what I have seen. And, and I think you, you more than the, these two drafts of paper that you started writing, you have much more things that you could be extracted from the gene you have. I didn't understand the end. Uh, that you, you can have much more scenes uh, besides the uh, uh, presented right now. That is yeah, the, yes, uh, I the, tend to perform this, this functional analysis, and I also, we are going to check if this pain genome analysis is in fact uh, correct, like the, the, te the, theta, uh, the theta predictions, they are not uh, ex acting as expected, and we want to re redo uh, kind of uh, analysis again, this, this pan genome analysis with other programs like Hoari or Conex, uh, even to confirm the results, because I think that the pan genome analysis is the basic that we need to, to go ahead. We need to, to be sure of this data to explore the other the other potentials, like the COG, CAG, genome enhancement, all these, these mechanisms we could do based on this, this first analysis. The genomic eyes ones know, but the, the machine learning uh, methods to understand this, this resistance to antimicrobials, and we can use this pan genome analysis as a basis to, uh, to advance in to other perspectives, you know? Yes. Can I make a comment on that? Yes. Before I forget, just because I, I'm, I'm sure if I do not say anything now, I'm, I'm gonna forget. Uh, for the pan genome analysis, I also would like to ask a question to Jeff, Marx, and to you, Andre, and also Vasco. It's because uh, all other analysis that we are going to, to make in the future depends on the pan genome analysis. We use the core genome for a lot of things, and uh, we we intend to do other other papers like uh, that said before, comparing MLST with the, the core MLST and the uh, all this and uh, first we decide use only the 20, 22 Karini genomes that are completely. I have open. a presentation slide, Elaine. Do you want me to share my screen? Yeah, yeah, you, you could do that. You could do that. And um, these are available in NCBI and are complete and closed genomes. However, uh, if we can use the, the scaffold, and uh, I'm not sure, but maybe also the drafts, I, I think the drafts would not be a good idea, but the, the, um, the scaffolds to do the pan genome, I would like to know if you think that this could be a good idea using only the 22 or if we should use the... Um, no, is this genome? Is this? Yeah, like the, the 104 scaffolds and we can also add this. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. You see, we have two scenarios: one with two, 21 genomes closed in the available in the NCBI, and are using the 104 scaffolds for the pan genome analysis. The core genome oh drops. I think the theta prediction of core genome we have to review because it's it's dropping in a, yeah a lot. Yeah, I, I haven't seen this data before. Yeah, because if you if you use all of the genomes, you can have a, a better pan genome estimation. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. But, but yeah. the core genome will have this problem. Because, because that's the question. Uh, I have no answer. I would like to have your opinion on that. 
because all the analysis we are going to do after depends on this analysis first. Mm -hmm. Should we use the 22? It's not 21 more because Karin said to me that in, on December someone yeah, uh, deposited another uh, genome. I think it's 22. But anyway, yeah. we should use 22 or 104 genomes. Hmm. I would say it depends on the, what, what you were trying to, to find. Okay. For example, if you if you would, if our, you use our main them. question is the determinants of uh, resistance, but we have other questions too. We can do both approaches. Mm -hmm. if, if you use the, the the analysis that I told you about the debruging graph, then you can use everything. It doesn't it doesn't there's no problem. But if you you were uh, using some uh, analysis that needs the core genome. Then if you use the scaffold, you have a, a, a core that are smaller, then it should be because of the uh, assembly artifacts. Some genes are not uh, present in some uh, of the genomes, but actually because it was not assembled, not because they don't have it. So it depends, as I said, it depends on the analysis. If you use all of them and you can find something using this core, this core genome so small, then it's fine. Then it's fine, but the problem is, I, I would try that first. If you find something, even in the core genome, even using all of them, okay, then you try just the complete genomes. Yeah, so I'll follow up a little bit. So it, it seems fine to use the larger subset or the 104 that includes read data for the pan genome. I think that's totally appropriate and there aren't many there are a few problems that you can run into, but they're they're not that you know substantial. But you can see right away that there's problems with the core genome, and usually that's due to it can be one genome actually causing those problems. And so a way to get around that is you can include only genomes in your core genome analysis that meet some threshold of of completeness and so say you align to a reference each of those you know read files against a reference and have some threshold above which you'll include those samples and so i highly suspect that some of those those NCBI scaffolds have really, or those genomes have, are pretty low quality. And because you're including them in the analysis, uh, it's affecting your overall core genome. We, this, is, this is common and we see this quite a bit. And so that would be my guess. And so having some level of quality control of those of those reads that you use in the analysis would be important. Okay, just one more thing. I, I, as I said, I would check the taxonomy of them. Maybe one of these genomes are not even Brucella, and that's why the core genome is, is so low. Maybe just yep. one genome, not because of the assembly, because it's not the same uh, genus. And are you going to tell us? Okay. Withdraw if you take some threshold as Jeff had suggested. So these, um, so this is for Brussels abortus, right? Yeah. Yes. So yes. I have, um, yeah. So this was a question that I didn't ask earlier, but what can you tell me about the fifty-three genomes that you have, or isolates actually? What are are, what biovar are they from? You know, bio, biovar isn't perfect, but do you know what biovar they're from? Yeah, I think it, they, this information are uh, available at the supplementary material, but if they are not, we have this also, the biovar, the ML, MLVA16 profile, we have the city, the year of isolation, we have the, the, this information, we have biovar. Yeah, so, um, I'll just, I, I have a lot of data on Brucella abortus that's not published. And I'll, I'll just say that um, uh, Brucella abortus, if, if it's part of BioVar 1, 2, or 4, and that's the common group, uh, they're, a gen, they're actually a genetic group or a clade 
that uh, has spread worldwide. And there's actually very little genetic diversity in that. And so it would be probably best if you're looking at a pan genome or even a core genome and your genotypes come from that group, you could really limit your analyses to just, you know, that group of Brucella abortus. And it would be a much more focused analysis. And so the like the pan genome of of um, Brucella abortus biovar nine, um, or the, even just the genome is very different than the other Brucella abortus. And so you can really focus in on just one group of Brucella abortus. And I'd be happy to share, you know, most of them are bio BioVar one. BioVar yes, one, yep. Yeah, yeah, most of them. We have some representatives from from other. One country. BioVar one, two, and three. That's six most. Six also. Yes. We have six, but I think it's only one. No, no, ah, four okay. is just only one. Which one? BioVar 4. Yeah. BioVar 4, I think. Oh, I, you don't have BioVar 4. I, yeah, yeah, I talk about them. the Silvis papers, not in your strength. But we have the BioVar 1 go, go to Germany, right? To BioVar 4. BioVar 4, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. We are sequencing this right now. It's not in my project. No, 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 no. Yes, I forgot it. We have, we have 72 of the 137 that the total one they're not the uh, 53 you have you have 72 by over one 16 by over two three by over three one by over four and 20 by over six I think. ah interesting very interesting but uh, we have to check the ones that uh, um, we have know, sequence yeah I think it's in the, the table, the supplementary table one from okay. the second chapter. Well, we can talk about more when you get into kind of more detailed analyses of, of this group, but uh, that's very interesting actually. And so those are, you definitely have two very, so dev, two very different introductions into Brazil then. Uh, one is the BioVars one, two, and four are part of this common, lineage that's been spread worldwide um, and BioVars 3, 6, and 9 are actually a very different one that probably comes from parts of, of Central Asia um, and it's not connected to that really common um, uh, what most of the world has. So that, that's very interesting actually. And that's something interesting because we have a lot of cattle that come from India. Yes, yes. Yeah, so you have, yeah, you have the two different types. You have the Bos Indica and the Bos Taurus there. And uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for mentioning that, Andre. Well, uh, can I ju just one thing right now? Uh, I think uh, you have a lot of things to do, and I, I hope both Marcus Vasquez and, and Jeff could help in the further analysis of the genome sequences you have. And I think you can get very, very interesting things from them. Thank you, Andre. You're welcome. So um, before I, I ask Professor Vasco if uh, he has some questions, I'd like also to, to um, ask especially Professor Jeff, what do you think, Jeff, that could be one approach, because Marcus already uh, gave us uh, some idea, what we should do for looking at this um, probably SNPs or uh, determinants of antimi antimicrobial resistance in Brucella. Because Andre said that Karini didn't put this as the first aim of uh, her search because we are like seeing that we are looking for a needle <laughs> in the 
But How can I say I forgot? Haystack. Yeah. Yeah, that's the point. Because it's something so difficult. Because uh, we have like, how, how many snips, Karin? 1900. 1900, okay. Uh, and uh, we, 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 are looking for a logical approach to find out which one could be related to antimicrobial resistance, which one we could we should investigate deeply to find if they are or not involved in the phenotype that where we are seeing. We are working with some uh, people that are specialists in statistics to help us, but maybe you have some uh, idea what we should do. Um, yeah, so for, yeah, so is your question about confirming SNPs and making that relationship between genotype and phenotype? Yes. Predicting phenotype without actually testing for it? Yes. Or, or just confirming, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, because we have these strains that, first of all, we, we tested these strains, I think, in 2009. Uh, for MIC, looking for antimicrobial resistance, but we we didn't expect to find this much of resistance, especially multi-drug resistance strains in Drusella. As you said, it's not common in Drusella. Now people are publishing some papers, uh, in Norwegian, uh, Italy, and some papers that are describing, especially Drusella militensis, that are multi-drug resistant. And uh, when we found that, we found we were what what. Brucella have that make these strains much more resistant and uh, a lot of strains resistant to rough rifampicin and uh, we got to sequence these strains and this was the main question of Karim's project but now we don't know how to connect these genomic data and the phenotype that we are seeing as Brucella has not the classical uh, genes for antimicrobials as aureus uh, as Staphylococcus aureus or as Pseudomonas it's a very particular and specifically uh, genus and species in case of Brucella bones. So, I, yeah, I would say that I don't have uh, an answer at the tip of my tongue, uh, although I certainly have some ideas about how you can approach it. And so the, f the first way I would, I would approach it is that I would create a phylogenetic tree a really detailed phylogenetic tree using SNPs from the whole genomes, right? And so then you can see what the structure is of all the samples that you have. Uh, and then you can kind of uh, identify or mark out on that tree where there are particular um, uh, shared changes uh, or synapomorphies that occur within particular strains. And so you can identify where there are, um, yeah, where there are specific differences that you're, that you should look for. Uh, and so you can map out those characters on that, on that tree and see exactly where they're occurring and which lineages share those changes and which lineages don't have those changes. That's at least a first pass. And so there's good kind of good um, examples as you talk about from, from Staph, Staph aureus in particular. Although, you know, you do have to be careful in that most of those changes are not you know, mutational changes, they're getting it from somewhere else. Uh, and so, but it actually makes it, oh, thank you, Andre. It makes it easier for, uh, it makes it actually easier in your case. You don't have to track down these genes that are coming in. There's no genes coming into Brucella. It's just mutations that, there's very few. Uh, and so it's just mutations that uh, that are, uh, are coming through. Um, that that's my first pass at it. Sorry, it's not as complete as it could be. I know it's not an easy question. <laughs> as of that, I'm sharing my thoughts with you all, and uh, I'm pretty sure uh, Karini is going to have a 
a great time in your lab and we we can have time to to find these these determinants of uh, antimicrobial resistance yeah and you can you can certainly start with the genes that are known to be associated uh really looking for any mutations that are occurring within those genes that you know are related to antimicrobial resistance at least start there and then kind of branch out and include more and more SNPs. But you can easily figure out is, you know, is this, is this mutation within a gene or a promoter region or is it not? And if it's intergenic, you can basically dismiss it right away and you don't have to kind of chase it down. But now, finally, I want to ask Professor Vasque if uh, he wants to ask some questions to Karina, say some comments. Um, not sure. Are you here, Vasco? Because he said that he was going to a meeting. May still be at the meeting. Yeah, I think so. He <laughs> said he said in the private chat that he has a meeting. So um, we can we can go to the attributing scores to Karin's qualification. And I'm going to put in the chat, in private chat here uh, a link for another uh, room. So we, the, the committee, Karin, goes there. You stay here, please. OK? And then when we decide if you are approved or not, we can come. OK? okay. <laughs> I'm going to put here the link. Just a minute. Because this discussion, discussion we can, you should, we must do. For. Okay, can we leave here and go to the link? And then oh. we come. Okay. No, no, Karin, stay here. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm sharing my screen. No, you are not. Okay. É, por que, que eu estou sozinho aqui? Oi, professor. <risos> é, então, a gente te tinha te perguntar, a professora Elaine perguntou se o senhor queria fazer algum comentário, mas eles estão dando uma nota agora. Daqui pois a pouco, é. quando eles voltarem, aí a gente. Aí o senhor uhum. coloca os seus comentários. Ah, você está pensando que eu sou Vasco? Ah, é o eu Marcos? Marcos? É. Não, Só você é não ouviu, Vasco. É, já me falaram isso, é porque o povo esqueceu de mim, aparentemente. Você entrou no link? Que link, meu Deus. Cadê Tem um link? link no chat privado aí. Ah, tá. Agora eu vi. Sua voz é igualzinha a dele. <risos> tá, eu vou lá agora.
We're back. <laughs> Hi, Karin. We're back. Hi. Um, wait for Andre. First, thank you again all the community members that made a lot of um, ventures. Can you hear me? Your sound is difficult to hear. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, sorry. I just uh, was saying that I would like to thank you all the committee members for the very nice discussion that we had about the Karin's project and um, that we can work from now and uh, we have a lot of things to do. Yes, Karin. And yeah. I'm really proud of what Karin has done. And um, I would like to say the, the, the results, the scores that you got, Karin. I'm going to say sorry for you, Jeff, because I had to read in Portuguese the, the document, okay? It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, Karin, então, vou ler a ata de defesa, tá? De defesa, não, de qualificação. É, aos 10 dias do mês de fevereiro de 2021, às 14 horas, sob presidência de Elaine Maria Séries Dornelis, e com a participação de André Pereira Laje, Marcos Vinícius Canário Viana e Jeffrey Foster, que eu a banca de qualificação de Karine Rodrigues Pereira, matrícula 2019-260-194, discente do curso de doutorado em ciências veterinárias. Após apurar, apurados os resultados da qualificação, a discente foi aprovada com nota 92, para constar foi lavrada a presente ata, que depois de lida aprovada vai assinada pelos membros da banca examinadora. Então, Karine, parabéns. É... Você merece todo o sucesso e a nota que você obteve, viu? Obrigada. Tá, agora a palavra é sua, fica à vontade. Eu gostaria de agradecer a toda a equipe que possibilitou que esse trabalho fosse feito. Eu não teria feito sim, sozinha, então toda a equipe do laboratório, os meninos que me ajudaram, a equipe que a gente tem como amizade também, né? Que às vezes a gente não tem ajuda só técnica, a gente tem um apoio moral e a equipe da Recon também, que eu sou muito feliz por fazer parte tem contribuído muito para mim o grupo, e esses esforços colaborativos é, têm sido fundamentais no meu treinamento, então só tenho realmente a agradecer a todo mundo que participou, torceu e me ajudou, e é isso, agora eu tenho muito trabalho para fazer. Né? Encontrei e agora isso está é uma nova etapa. Né? So, thank you, Rus. Vasco, do you want to, want to say something? Because uh, in the other time I, I asked, but if you were here are you here now <laughs> i'm not sure if uh, he, he is here with us okay so thank you Jeff. Uh, it's a great pleasure having you in the committee and uh, i'm very glad and happy that karim is going to your lab i'm pretty sure she will have a great time there thank you yes, for that sounds great thank you for inviting me Oh, I have to thank you. And thank you, Andre, for all it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karina. Thank you. Congratulations, in fact. Thank you, Marcos. Yeah, well done. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, see you. All right. Bye-bye.